just to sort of set a bit of the context of some of the discussion today um, and sort of why we did the report, um, it was a follow-up to the first new national purpose that we did with William Haig and Tony Blair, uh, in which we covered sort of how Britain isn't really ready for the science and tech revolution that has been sweeping over the world for the last sort of couple of decades, um, and it still hasn't really caught up in its sort of state institutions. Uh, that covered sort of the whole array of both the institutional architecture that's needed for that and some of the technologies which we think are important. Uh, AI we named, uh, that was in early March, and I think the events of the last few months have sort of borne out uh, how important that technology is uh, because of the developments that we've seen that are just happening at breakneck speed. Um, so we sort of dug into this area a little bit further, uh, thinking about generative AI in particular, but the wider kind of ability of the state to understand and handle a technology that is in an exponential growth curve uh, and really is has the potential to change sort of many aspects of society and the economy. Um, I, I, I don't think it's an overstatement to say we are actually in a new era. Um, I know it's at the very early stages of this, but I think the, sort of the long tail of this technology will have an impact that is of the same magnitude or probably even larger than electricity, the combustion engine, and the internet, all of which uh, are very hard to predict of what they, you know, they did in the early days, but they ultimately shifted lots of our social and economic structures. Um, so a few of the areas that we just touched on in the report are basically around that sort of state architecture, how you build up the expertise within the state, uh, as well as actually how the UK, who had some frontier companies, or still has some frontier companies, such as DeepMind, uh, builds more of them because uh, it's quite clear that a, a technology as important as this will give countries a strategic edge uh, within the world today. And I think there's obviously a big risk around some of the aspects of people talking about in an arms race, but I think if that's sort of uh, sensibly brought forward, there's actually some huge impacts that AI can have across a whole raft of domains, not least in areas like healthcare, education, and much more. Um, but that's sort of the context. Um, and maybe just to kick things off, because I think understanding the technology um, is not easy, and understanding some of the, the sort of the wide debates, whether they're sort of existential risk and nuclear fallout and we're all going to die, uh, are sort of driving some of the debate into uh, some interesting domains. But um, why don't we just as I kick things off, um, Nathan, why don't you just sort of talk about sort of the state of AI, where we're at, and UK's place within that ecosystem? Uh, sure, yes, it's a big pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, the history of AI sort of dates back to the 50s or, or something like this. So uh, we've kind of been on this very long-term journey of trying to build, you know, intelligent machines that can start to, you know, learn tasks that humans can accomplish that, you know, machines previously couldn't. And we've gone through, I'd say, like a steady uh, kind of pace of growth, uh, you know, over many years and then punctuated by these sort of uh, on-the-moment unpredictable step changes in capabilities that, you know, ultimately lets us solve problems that previously we couldn't crack before. And so clearly we're living through that now uh, with these large language models, et cetera. Um, and I think it's important to also realize that um, you know, many of these inventions that uh, you know, today enable machine learning to work were developed by academics and scientists, many of whom did their training in Europe and in particularly uh, in the UK. So um, you know, we have, I think, a native advantage from day zero in the sense of training and being the kind of R&D lab for the world, if you will. Um, and, you know, we are like a center of capital in Europe, and so I think we have a very important role to play. A lot of the major publications come out of the UK every year, so we're behind the US and China. And, um, and I think we've got, uh, you know, as the report and the one before it, um, you know, suggests like a real opportunity to kind of take a blank slate and think how can the country make use of its resources and position itself to be the most competitive. Um, now, I think, you know, ultimately, I think we'll get into some of these topics, but, um, you know, many of the strategies that we have today are the right idea, but they're just not ambitious enough, and the timelines are not uh, kind of short enough to, to accomplish some of these goals. Um, and, you know, from my perspective, investing in AI first companies, like I see entrepreneurs here all the time that want to really swing big, uh, particularly in areas that I think are of uh, national importance, such as defense technology, quantum, AI, energy, uh, hardware. Um, but again, I think the state has to do more to really enable these companies to, to take a big swing. We can kind of get into, into some of that. Excellent. Um, 
I also just realised one thing, obviously, in my intro I forgot to say, uh, is that Nina Schick was supposed to be on the panel today uh, and uh, unfortunately couldn't make it due to some childcare issues, but I also just wanted to apologise because I know it has become a manual. Um, so we will open it up to the, uh, the audience for questions as well, so it's not just three men talking uh, about AI, everyone else throughout. So... Um, on, I think there's a, you raised a really important point on sort of lots of strategies. They don't do enough, and they're probably also not delivered. Um, uh, I think one of the things that we've been quite critical of over the last few years with government is that we keep dumping lots of papers. And I, I say that as someone that's put out a paper uh, uh, and uh, really hasn't then just followed through with the implementation side of that. Um, uh, Darren, I mean, what's your perspective on... The government's, uh, well, let's say their strategy uh, and actually their ability to deliver on them. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I think there's a, a fundamental problem and then a kind of operational problem. Uh, the operational problem is that, as many of you will know, in, in Whitehall, what, what do we do? We do a consultation. We then publish the response to a consultation. We then maybe write a strategy that takes quite a long time. We then publish the strategy. If we're lucky, we might get the Treasury to give us a nice round figure, maybe, I don't know, £150 million, and we say, we're spending £150 million on our strategy, and then we move on. Um, and from my perspective, we're not very good either at implementation or at reviews, um, or actually thinking in a much more structural, fundamental way, as opposed to this just being one new cycle. Um, and also, by the way, the £150 million thing always annoys me because I'm like, how did you come up with that number? Like, what does that actually mean? Did you kind of figure out what you wanted to do, cost it, and then come up with it? And was it really like £149.80? pence, Or was it... I mean, so I would rather we flip to the discussion. What are the outputs or the outcomes that we're trying to achieve? Um, and then build the institutional structure to be able to, to deliver that and manage it properly. The other thing I would say is that we're not very good in Whitehall, no offence to anyone that's worked in Whitehall, at, at building products. Um, so where we're trying to build things that support the private sector, what do we do? Um, we'll give you a voucher. Uh, and then we over-engineer the voucher. And you've got to go through three weeks of fraud checks. And you can only go to approve suppliers. And if it doesn't work for your business, well, tough. And then we underspend, and the Treasury says, I'll have that back, thanks. So just the very way that we kind of operationalize some of these things isn't, isn't adequate um, from my perspective. And we have to think differently. And that includes for legislators in Parliament as well. We have to think about how we draft legislation differently in this space. I'm conscious of witching on. The first point, though, on fundamental issues. I mean, I do... Uh, this is such a deep structural opportunity for the country to help us with our economic woes, our public service failures, and Britain's role in the world, that we almost need government to respond to it in that way. It is not just a strategy or a voucher. It should be at the heart of any political uh, agenda. And that raises some really big and difficult questions. If you want technology to be adopted uh, widely across the economy, if you want public servants to be excited, not fearful of the opportunity, if you want businesses to spend money investing, uh, you're going to need to flip the incentives because at the moment a lot of people are just scared by it or don't think it's a priority or don't understand it. And so you need to create an inclusive economic and political model that supports people on that transition. And that's a much deeper, bigger problem that I don't think we in Westminster and Whitehall have really started to grasp yet. I think there's probably a lot we can dig into on that, actually. Yeah. Uh, why don't we start with... Let's just do a little bit more into sort of made-up numbers. Um, and I say this as a uh, ex-Treasury uh, civil servant, so um, uh, whether you can sometimes believe where some of these numbers are coming from or not is always a, a good question of government watching. Um, so we've got <clears throat> 900 million for compute. Um, we've got the, you know, the task force, which are both actually, I'd say, good policy directional. Um, but I think... Number one, there's probably not enough money there. Number two, it's probably a lot of repackaged stuff, which is you know, hard to actually sometimes make sense of. And number three, the timelines are, I mean, a super, you know, compute by 2026, which also doesn't fully have the AI capacities that we want. Um, what more do you think the government needs to be doing around some of those aspects? And I hear from both of you on that as well, particularly, because I think uh, Nathan has a lot of thoughts on compute in particular. But Darren, why don't you sort of have a... 
Sure. I, I mean, I, I, not wanting to sound repetitive, but why 900 million? I mean, I just don't, I genuinely don't know why that... No, I mean, it sounds like a big number, which probably sounds good in the context of what we're talking about, but I don't, I don't know what government's buying with this, or from whom, or, or by when. Like, what am I going to see at the end of having spent 900 million? I mean, unless I've missed something, in which case I apologise. So, I mean, I don't know whether that's right or not. And it's very hard for those of us in Parliament to scrutinise the government if there's the kind of lack of substantive detail that's, that's underpinning it. And just by extension, I, I mean, how does the state partner with the private sector on these types of initiatives? You know, we've already gotten into the debate about how um, for the largest foundational models, you know, some companies are asking for kind of license approval, which of course has deep anti-competitive <laughs> Uh, outcomes. Um, so does state infrastructure fill that gap? If so, that, there's a bit of a business case there that can make sense uh, to me. Or is, are we providing access for other purposes? How does that work if there is going to be a licensing regime of five or six companies that have the most advanced compute power, which are broadly not in the UK anyway? So I, I would just want a little bit more detail about what it is that we're trying to achieve. The irony being actually that you know, when government normally announces a policy and some money for a new cycle, um, it's usually so people say, oh, that sounds good. I actually don't think anyone really knows what a foundational model is <laughs> in the public. Um, and so I just think the whole thing needs, needs more work, both yeah. in terms of how the public understand it, what it is that we're actually trying to achieve, um, and therefore what it is that we're spending, spending the money on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe just some quick comments to put the compute review under, I guess, comparative light. So, I mean, directionally, again, I, I would agree. I think it's the, the right thing for the country to do. You know, it has to have its own, uh, you know, state-owned or, um, you know, UK resident capacity in order to, you know, train state-of-the-art models and understand actually where is this technology going and how does it work and how, how can we make the best use of it. But... Um, you know, the review 900 million pounds sounds like a big number, but, you know, Anthropic, which is, you know, barely like a two-year-old company in the U.S., um, was recently talking to the U.S. government, and, you know, they were saying that we need to spend four billion on our compute cluster. Um, <clears throat> 3,000 GPUs, well, they didn't specifically name GPUs, but 3,000 accelerators in the compute review, uh, that's probably 10 times smaller than some of the clusters that U.S. private and public technology companies have today. Um, this exascale by 2026, we already have this online today uh, in major technology companies, so um, it's basically irrelevant. Um, and, uh, and, and then the, the notion of um, you know, all the opportunities for AI in public services, I think, is really there. I mean, I invest in technology companies that make use of AI. I believe that it's, that does exist, but there's kind of a difference to wanting to implement AI and make good use of it and being ready to do that. Um, and just to like take an example, um, you know, I think all of us cherish the NHS and it's got amazing amounts of data, we think, uh, and centralized patient records, et cetera, that should make it a good ground to start to improve, you know, public services around healthcare for, for nationals in the country. But, you know, let's recall that DeepMind has been trying to work with the NHS for God knows how long and had ambitions to transform its services using AI. Uh, and basically what we ended up getting was a task management app for clinicians. Um, and, you know, that's not because, uh, you know, the technology wasn't ready per se. It's really because of the data organization, the compute uh, infrastructure, the way of working, the sort of chaos that exists in some of these public services that makes it very difficult to apply something state of the art if you don't have the foundations that are there. Uh, and so these are very long term like investments that we have to make. And we can't just wake up 10 years after a lot of the same actors that are now, you know, at the top of their game that were born and bred in this country are now telling us that we need to do something. Like it's sort of, I'd argue almost 10 years too late. I mean, I grew up in grad school in this country. Like I, I, I've seen many of these people that now run these companies and it's sort of painfully obvious to me like where everything was going. And um, it's sort of now that we started to wake up and, and realize that we need to start getting API keys from OpenAI to start to figure out where this technology is going to go. You know, I mean, it's just not good enough. Um, I actually think that the DeepMind example is a really good one of our failure of the political system uh, and you know, got absolutely hammered on some, you know, there were genuine questions that we had to have around privacy and data security, etc. But then to essentially sort of use them as a little political football for some of the failures of uh, uh, the wider system to do this. Uh, I, maybe though, I mean, sort of put it on a sort of potential 
optimistic note for how we can do public service reform. Uh, because I think you're completely right around the data infrastructure. One of the things that we talk about quite a lot in the report and the previous report is nations getting into the mindset of treating data like a competitive asset. Uh, and what we really mean by that is that you know a lot of the sort of the, the breakthroughs in technologies over the last past couple of decades have been through the ability to you know basically get good data and then utilize that for, for products. Um, and for many years we've talked about that within the NHS, and as you say, this sort of this brilliant potential gold mine we're sitting on. Um, but the state doesn't curate data in that kind of way, or at least doesn't have the architecture to do it. I think you know, the biobank was one good example of where we did do it, but we need more of that to be able to unleash some of the potential in public services. Um, I, I don't know, Darren, if you have any sort of particular ideas around public service reform and AI where you think there needs to go a lot mm. harder, particularly on the infrastructure side and, and where the, some of the reforms need to happen. Yeah, you might need to hold me back in yeah. my answer <laughs> on, that, on that question. Um, let, let's take health as an example. When I was an undergraduate, one of my kind of um, you know, jobs whilst I was studying uh, was as a data analyst for the NHS. And what that actually meant was that I went to GP surgeries and was given boxes of what were called Lloyd George's named after Lloyd, just how long ago. It was a little A5 paper file with the little cards in. And if you're old enough, you'll remember seeing the GP kind of pull out these cards and write uh, you know, words that no one else could read on them, put them back in. That was your data. And it was probably under the last Labour government, actually, that Labour was paying uh, GPs to try to put some of this information on a computer, because they thought that would be a good idea, very good foresight. And people like me were being paid to do it. So I used to go in, you know, between lectures or whatever and kind of code this data onto the system. Um, but of course, GP surgeries had different system providers, they had servers in their own back office. Um, and let me tell you, having put some of the data in, there wasn't really a standardized approach to putting all the data in. And so the data is like not in a place that can be used with a you know, large language model, for example, and using chat bots or whatever to be able to get answers out of it. And I often compare this to, say, um, the Olympic Park in Stratford, right? Enormously successful development, lots of exciting things. It only happened because the government paid <clears throat> for the decontamination of the land. No one else was going to pay for that. But had the state not provide, provided that function, that whole development would not have happened. So I would much rather government was saying, you know, this isn't very sexy, but we're going to put a load of resource behind cleaning and up and standardizing our data pools so that we can actually maybe start to use them in a way that can be trained or used with large language models or innovators can come in and check databases with certain questions across the NHS system. You know, the fundamental jobs that no one else is really going to pay to do, I think the state should be um, uh, should be doing. And the other thing, of course, is that that job is huge. I mean, across so many departments, universal credit is another one of my soapboxes. I obviously support the idea of universal credit, but we employ 37,000 full-time equivalent civil servants to administer universal credit. It's a digital payment, right? I mean, the database, as I understand it, I think 10 different cloud contracts to host the data. I mean, these things are just are just mad. And that's before you even get into some of the bad examples in, in Whitehall. Universal Credit is a relatively new one. So the question I don't know the answer to is whether we have the capacity, time, and money to do that land decontamination work example across every single service product payment across Whitehall, or whether we just have to say, do you know, we're not we're not gonna be able to do that hundred percent effectively. So we need to build new core infrastructure right now, get some early adopter citizens <coughs> plugging in and playing on new design systems, knowing that they might not always work to begin with, and over time start to move things over bit by bit, and then be able to show the public, and we should probably talk about public engagement at some point on, on yeah. these issues, that they want to join the new gov.uk app that means they can see their HMRC data, their payee data, their child tax credits eligibility linked through to their NHS app. I'm not quite sure what the answer is, whether it's the first or the or the second, but um, I don't think we've actually really started doing any of that work. And I, until we do, I don't think we can unleash the opportunities of public sector reform. Yeah. Mm. 
I think that's right. I mean, Nathan, from your perspective, sort of company building as well, how much do you think that sort of... I mean, I always think sometimes there's going to be a bit of a virtuous cycle that can be created if the yeah. state can create that right kind of data, which then is create the right kind of access for, for companies as well. But how important do you think that is yeah. to, to, to build the company infrastructure in the UK as well? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great point. Um, I mean, I can see sort of vendors on both sides of that equation. And I think to me that gets to the point of like government procurement. I mean, there's, you know, there's any number of founders that would love to build data infrastructure for the NHS, et cetera, but then when they start trying to go through the government procurement um, rigmarole, they, they end up never coming out. Um, and you know, one of the obvious examples, at least to me, uh, recently in defense, which is an area that I've been digging into, is like uh, you know, the UK government and public sector just you know, blew five billion pounds on an Ajax tank from General Dynamics that never delivered. And yet you know, there's more and more companies that want to build technology that actually has a real need now, but that just can't make it through the procurement cycle. And, and I you know, suspect that doing something in the NHS would probably be not, not so different. Um, and um, and so, so yeah, so I, I think you know, in, in, instead, of also, instead of kind of looking at supporting companies through purely um, you know, administering like funding sources through the future fund or like you know, investing in technology companies, I think acting as a buyer of first resort would be a great idea. Um, and through our work in the State of AI report, uh, you know, I learned in, in the 60s um, in the U.S. the government, you know, became the buyer first resort for all integrated circuits on the market because at that time they had some, uh, you know, some military need, et cetera, and that was before the commercial sector had a need. And so it sort of sprung this industry into, into existence when probably VCs weren't around or, or, or private companies weren't around to buy it. Yeah. And I think nowadays we're sort of in a similar era with other areas of technology, in particular you know, AI semiconductors, where yeah, we have one behemoth, but I think we all agree that it's a fantastic company, it's great to use in NVIDIA, but it would be great if we had a few more options. Um, and so I think you know, government would have a, a great role to play there too, to sort of pump prime the, yeah. the market. You know? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I mean, procurement is one of those things I think to outsiders looking in just must be one of those boring words and boring parts of government, but is it's so important yeah. for this ecosystem, which is uh, incredible. And I think I think you touched on sort of three things there, which I think are really sort of actually intertwined. And we touched on a few of them in the report again, because we talk about procurement and a new advanced procurement agency, which yeah. does that, that buyer first resort kind of aspects and looking at some of where the US has been very, very good at this over the years, whether through you know, DARPA type models or, you know, sort of you know, uh, through sort of the, even through the military industrial complex yep. has actually scaled a lot of these yep. technologies as we see them today. And I think semiconductors is a really great example as well, because um, I was actually reading the Chris Miller Chip War book mm. um, uh, recently, and it talked about when Japan was coming on sort of you know, up in the 80s, and you know, basically they thought we're going to eat America's lunch, uh, and America responded and, as they did again today with the Inflation Reduction Act and the industrial policy in an incredibly strong way to try and maintain its comparative advantage to that. And I think our semiconductor strategy doesn't go anywhere uh, really to that, but uh, maybe just a sort of a broad reflection on industrial yeah. policy and its yeah. importance in pulling through some of these sort of key strategic technologies today. Yeah, I, I much said a bit about procurement as well, if, if I may. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Uh, I mean, two of the problems as I see it around procurement are if you're a pre-revenue startup, you're not allowed in. And unless you've got a kind of at least a one million pound indemnity policy, you're not allowed in. <laughs> and that just blocks immediately lots and lots of really interesting companies. Um, and there are, there are two things that I would love to see, one medium term and one long term. The medium term I would love to see is that the new Department for Science, Innovation and Technology becomes this kind of catalyst or Whitehall consultancy that kind of goes into the other departments and says, hey, health, give me your top three problems. Hey, justice, give me your top three problems. And then it goes back to DSIT, and it actually starts to procure some of the innovations, provide sandboxes or spaces where people can come in and try to find some of the solutions um, to those challenges. And that you might test them within DSIT, you might get a pilot somewhere um, across, the, across the country, you verify it, and if you're then content that it's something that can provide a, a solution at scale, DC actually works with those innovators through the procurement process. And if government has to kind of underwrite some of the liability, as we did in the vaccine task force, um, then we should find a way for, um, for, for that to happen. And in a way, then DC is kind of spinning in innovation into the other departments and feeding up any of the public infrastructure requirements that need to 
that need to allow that to happen. The longer term thing that I would, I would love to see, wouldn't it be great if, and I don't know whether the state would be able to provide this or whether we need to work with Apple and Google, it's probably the latter, but wouldn't it be great if we had a gov.uk app store uh, where the central infrastructure was all owned by the state, so that the public knew their privacy and security standards were you know, ruthlessly guarded within that app store. There were core government apps, you know, pay your tax, NHS app, you know, specific. But then innovators were able to build apps and plug and play. I, I, that's something I thought about the other day. I would love to pay somebody like £10 a month to get an app that gets my and my wife's income data, tax payments, pension payments, gift aid, my number of children, which is going up quite a lot, which is why this is relevant to me, um, um, and my eligibility for tax-free childcare, and automated the whole process and just paid my nursery for me. Because at the moment, every single month, I have to log on, I have to do the 80% of the thing, math myself, and then do the payment, and then wait two days for it to land, and then log back on again, and then do the payment to my provider. And then every three months, I have to go back on and verify my status and say that my pay hasn't changed. And you know, well, you know, wouldn't it be great if somebody could build an app and I would pay for that. And they would just have the ability, if they met the standards on privacy and security and everything else, to kind of come into the gov.uk app store and allow that to flourish across the public sector. Wouldn't that be wonderful? The audience, I think, you know, the vote winner there. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. Uh, we talk about proactive public services around that as well because I, I think that's one of the huge benefits of this. And we've seen, um, I mean, some countries have been pretty good at this and the UK is again, sort of falling behind on another aspect of this. But the key thing, tell me to shut up a bit if I'm no, going, but the key thing it. again is around incentives. You know, if you want people to take this stuff up, if you want people to do this innovation, they've got to be, they've got to want to do it. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be great if there was a nurse in the hospital in my constituency who spotted something that could just like really annoyed everybody and could be fixed? Where do they go at the moment to say to somebody, I've got a, I think I've got a thing here that's really going to solve this problem for it? When there's nowhere for them to go, wouldn't it be even better if they had someone to talk to, the NHS then said, hey, we've got this scheme that will help you verify and validate and test this. And then if it works, uh, you can either help us run it within the NHS and remain a public servant, or we'll help you protect your IP. Why don't you spin it out and then yeah. sell it to the NHS? And go off and do a great job. Just flipping the incentive kind of discussion around all of this. And that's why I think actually for a lot of this stuff, it can't be a top-down reform. Yeah. I don't think we should be announcing, we being the Labour Party, you know, we're gonna spend 300 billion pounds reforming public services. I just think that would fail. It has to be a kind of bottom-up led uh, approach. We, I just I have to flag, we've got some work coming out around on this because I think completely agree with the incentive structure, particularly in health, because mm. the amount of times we re reorganize the NHS, rethink it and try and do a top down approach, whereas you have to get the system reforming itself and incentivize people within the system to want to bring through the innovations and reform because it will just continue to fail and not pull through these kind of technology. And I think the other, the other point on that, which I think is actually critical as well, which is, you know, policy often is very focused on additionality mm -hmm. so oh, let's have another fund or let's do this let's do that and actually a lot of it should be focused on what's to strip away to remove some of those kind of barriers that people yeah. are finding that actually block them from making the right reforms as well mm -hmm. and I think they're both really critical points within any form of innovation ecosystem so um, absolutely um, so I know we've got some other big topics we probably need to touch on I think you uh, you mentioned one of them um, which is sort of public engagement around this um, and I know that people are going to want to hear whether you know we are all going to die at some point. So uh, we'll, we'll touch on both of those. But why don't we start with sort of democratic engagement around these technologies? Because um, I do think it is important. And I think the, the one thing that my view on sort of the history of technology is, uh, and there's some value in this, but you quite often see a sort of a, let's say, a period of permissionless innovation as technologists go off and they build their technologies and the government doesn't really understand them, kind of doesn't know what to do, and then 20 years later it goes, oh, crap, something's gone wrong here, and then it just only has a hammer to respond to them. Uh, and I guess, how do we learn from some of those sort of previous cycles of sort of technology to think how do you actually more have a structured engagement which both the technologists are involved in this thing, you know, the, the politicians are involved, but also the public, because I think AI is one of those ones that could have hugely transformative social impacts, some 
winners, some losers, I think. I think we have to sort of be quite clear that I think there are going to be some trade-offs within this. And how do we sort of structure some of those conversations so people can both make sense of that, understand the change coming, but also be all part of that discussion? Um, I know we sort of talk about sometimes things like deliberative democracy, citizens' juries, but uh, are there any sort of really practical ways that you think we could sort of structure some of those conversations? And I'd love to hear it from sort of both sides as well, from how you know, technologists wants to invade, the investor wants to engage with government and government wants to get that right kind of engagement from the other side as well. Did you just say technologists want to invade government? <laughs> no, uh, so engage with government. Oh. That was, uh, yeah. Maybe that would be a good thing. I don't bad know. elocution. Oh, there, okay. so, yeah. um, so on public understanding, um, uh, my sense is the public maybe don't really get what this is all about too much. Um, I'm quite annoyed because I did a constituency assembly, which was a citizens' assembly, but like at a constituency level a couple of months ago. And we got 50 people uh, selected from the constituency that represented the broader uh, demography. Um, and all but one of them had never been involved in a political event before. And it was great because you could really test ideas and perceptions with them, but it was before ChatGPT came out. So I'm kind of annoyed, really. I'm out to do it again. Um, but my sense is, is that if I ask constituents, they will have seen in the news, certainly recently, like AI and artificial intelligence. But they would then also have seen the stuff that like, says it's going to kill us all. And that's probably the end of the discussion. Um, and so I don't think the public really understand what AI is. I don't think m many legislators do, to be honest. Um, uh, but the tone is already negative. And it's, you know, it's right that we have to think about you know, national security level risk. It's right that we respond to that and collaborate with allies and all that stuff is right and proper. But we've got to try to start talking about it in a positive way. Because again, to go back to the incentives point, I think if you asked any of my constituents, whether they worked in the private sector or the public sector, if your boss started using new technology at work, would you see that as an exciting opportunity to improve your productivity, your work, day-to-day, -day, your opportunity to learn new skills, hopefully even to improve your pay? Or would you see it as something that might be fearful, that you don't feel you have the skills or understanding, that you think it might take your job? It's, it's definitely the latter category at the moment. And we've got to try to shift it to the positive. And that does require, I think, a lot of public engagement about what, what actually is it that we're talking about? Uh, what does it mean? Give some case studies and, and examples. Um, and the last time the public really experienced technology in the context of their public service delivery, I think probably at a, a national level, there's probably the you know, gov.uk website, um, or maybe the idea that you have like a gov.uk ID, although we've all got 12 or 13 of them that don't work. That's the last thing they really experienced in the public sector. So if the public, which isn't really kind of tuned into these things every single day, think about their own lived experience, it's a bit of negative reporting, it's fear at work, and it's not a very good experience with public services. Um, and so I would like to see you know, the government with broadcasters, media, NGOs, and others kind of trying to have a much wider debate uh, in the public about what does this mean. And I, I'm a supporter of citizens' assemblies. Um, I think they work really well, but it's how the impact of that assembly, what impact that assembly has on the wider public that's the really interesting question. But we have to do that now because otherwise, if some, when something goes wrong, because it will, you might have a hypersensitive reaction. The public start calling for politicians to close these things down, and then politicians over there stand up and say, close these things down, and everyone closes it down, and then we've missed the opportunity. Nathan, maybe from your perspective, one of the things that obviously people in technology say is that government really doesn't understand the technology and get incredibly frustrated. Uh, how do you think you have sort of a more productive conversation or what would be your sort of ask of politicians in trying to engage with the technology sector? Yeah, you? yeah. I mean, at the, at the moment, I think, um, yeah, for the point that was discussed, like a lot of the discussion in the public is really bipolar and it's really um, kind of some overwhelming small constituents like big technology companies and then people who think that we're going to be exterminated with AI. And, and I think we really have to normalize the debate a little bit and like kind of get back to grounded uh, terrain, um, because I, I personally don't think it is productive to start invoking, you know, loss of life and loss of livelihood, et cetera, as a way of sort of shaking the system for it to do something. And as far as I understand, that's unfortunately the, the situation that we're in is that there, I think speaking of government sometimes is a bit too broad because I, 
I've gotten to know people in there and I think there are some incredibly competent people in there who genuinely do understand what's going on. And some of them do have advanced degrees in this stuff. Um, so they are saying things, but from what I was told, just no one's listening above. And so it's like no one's listening until we tell them it's going to kill us, and then they start to listen, <laughs> um, which, which makes me kind of afraid that that's like the situation that we're in. Um, so hopefully now that we've kind of like shook, shook the tree a little bit, we can kind of walk, walk it back with a bit more pragmatism, because unless somebody can point uh, like a clear path towards getting to whatever godlike intelligence um, looks like, then I just don't think it's good enough to argue that there's an infinitesimal probability that that might happen. Um, so... Uh, and then I think the other thing with AI, perhaps different to other technologies, um, you know, perhaps like you know, a lot of people invoking nuclear and other things like this, is that um, is that AI diffuses really quickly. Um, and I think you know more people have heard of ChatGPT than any other invention of recent history. I think, uh, according to like user growth charts, and so it's sort of like in people's hands in a way that it wasn't before. Um, and of course, machine learning has been around as we discussed. Um, you know, at the start of the session for many years, but it was in the sort of guts of the internet, the sort of infrastructure, the routing algorithms in your Uber Eats app, and it's not, it's, it's not like real to you um, as ChatGPT is. Um, so, in, in, in a sense, I think, um, you know, everybody has the power of these things now. We've sort of gone from zero to one really quickly, um, further to the point of these uh, unpredictable um, sort of capability improvements very quickly. And so we got to go through a cycle of education and like normalization for how these technologies work. Uh, what are the limitations? What are the, sh sorry, the near-term harms, uh, which are I think much more important and topical than like the existential ones. Um, and, uh, and, you know, at, at, we're trying to do our, you know, our part with the state of the airport, and I realize that that probably doesn't cater to absolutely everybody uh, in, in the world, but like the goal there is to really try and level set, like where, where are we coming from, where might we be going next, and, um, and use that as a starting point to have an informed conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you probably both answered the existential risk question there within the part of that. Um, and I, I really agree, Darren, on this. It's just like people might not understand like neural networks or compute, et cetera, but they understand that this is a thing and it has become a doorstop sort of question for politics this year, which is quite phenomenal. You know, the largest consumer growth, uh, app growth in the history, um, you know, and businesses are adopting this in a way that I have not seen in sort of my reasonably, you know, middle, let's say, length life. To, uh, uh, but maybe... I mean, I've got a little bit of time, but it'd be great to maybe get some audience questions as well. Um, uh, and obviously, far away, if you want to hear more on existential risk, nuclear risk, or you know, actually sort of the practicals of procurement, because we can see that excites uh, the people here. So uh, uh, I think the gentleman in the glasses was first. Yeah. Morning, uh, Anthony Walker from Tech UK. Um, uh, thank you for an interesting discussion and congratulations on an excellent report. I think it's, it's really good. Um, I wanted to ask a, a, a question about sort of in, the speed of innovation, the speed of policy making, and then politics. Mm. Um, because it seems to me that the speed of innovation is clearly going very quickly, and lots of people are saying that we're at a perhaps the biggest inflection point in terms of digital technology that we've seen to date. Um, we've heard today about how the challenge of policy making and, and the need for policy making to perhaps go more quickly, but also be more deliberative. Um, and then we've got the political cycle, yeah. uh, which doesn't exactly uh, you know, make that kind of thoughtful, deliberative, but agile and quick policy making um, you know, particularly easy. Um, the thing we can't do is change where we are at in terms of the pace of innovation and the innovation cycle. So how should politics and policy making cope with the next 18 months of what needs to be done? Yeah, that's a great question, John. Take that, Darren, and I'll yes. some reflections. Um, uh, your, your time scale at the end of your question caused me a little bit of anxiety um, <laughs> uh, in that I'm not sure I'm going to see much innovation in the next 18 months, to be honest. Um, the one thing I would say is that, uh, on a positive note, I've, I've noticed that there are many, many more politicians now who are having these discussions than before. When I arrived in 2017 and was interested in this area, there's basically nobody that was talking about it. The way they talk about it, though, is they often talk about it in, the, in their kind of sector-specific context. So if you ask people working in the health team, they talk about this a lot. If you talk, talk to people in the justice team, they're starting to talk about this because they're seeing it as the kind of applications or the case studies that can solve their problems, which is really good. Um, 
we could be better at horizon scanning. And one of the challenges we've had recently on the kind of we're all going to die tour um, is how do, how do the politicians really grasp the risk profile and kind of disaggregate the, the hypothetical and the probabilities of the hypotheticals and kind of where we are in the time scale. It's quite hard for us to, to visualize and, and kind of get our hands around, around that. So we need to be better at, at that. Then on actual policy decisions, um, I mean, all of the stuff that you guys have been talking about um, in your reports, they're not the normal policy propositions we would see in Whitehall talking about, you know, uh, compute um, or language models. Or, it's not the type of stuff we talk about ever, really. And so we've got to come up with new tools in the toolbox, um, not trying to anticipate every single outcome or case study that requires a policy answer, but trying to find the outcomes-based approach that, that, that might try to manage that disruption in, in, an, in an effective way as possible. And I'd lastly just say on legislation, um, I think we have to be more innovative in the way we draft legislation. Um, because, as we've seen with the online safety bill, if you're trying to understand everything and anticipate everything kind of in real time, let alone in advance, you can't. And then everyone keeps chucking in lots of other things, and then it goes on year after year after year, and then you finally get a bill done, and it's already out of date. So we're going to have to find a new way of delegating some form of oversight or power or authority not just to ministers and, and regulators, but maybe to new agencies, and put in the appropriate checks and balances so that democratically we're happy with that governance, but that allows that more kind of nimble, real-time responsiveness in the way that the way we currently draft primary legislation doesn't allow us to. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'll just add a couple of points on that as well. I think that's absolutely spot on. Um, I mean, there's a couple of... Uh, the antitrust debates that we've seen over the years in technology are good examples of the inability to sort of keep up with the pace. <laughs> um, and I think even you know, Microsoft, when it went into antitrust sort of uh, elements in the 90s, it took 20 years to make a decision on that. And similarly, we saw that with the platforms by the time, which actually you've seen then huge shifts in the market as well. And people like TikTok have come up and you know, stolen other parts of the uh, uh, Facebook's lunch, and et cetera. But um, so I, I think the legislation point is absolutely critical on this and how we actually do legislation. Um, one of the things that we actually think about also in the long-term side is actually why we're calling for this sort of public sector lab that has deep expertise on it because what we're trying to solve for is simultaneously like how you get government up that learning curve quickly within the technologies, has that expertise to interrogate it, but mm. to, to your exact point, it can actually take a bit of that sort of I guess a bit like what happened with the MPC, uh, you know, with monetary policy, take some of that kind of, you know, not the full responsibility of the government in this thing, but actually ensures that there's always a place of which there's nestles to actually then be able to answer these questions and give that kind of expertise within to the government and kind of removes it from that democratic cycle. And I think that's a really, really uh, important point because I think you're completely right. If you're always working with a four-year window and technology's sort of cycles are on an exponential growth and six months churning around, um, it's very, very hard to actually do long-term reform within that. So yeah, I think it's a really, really important point. Um, Molly, do you want to pick someone? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So Ellie Horwich from New Market Strategy. I had actually two brief questions, if I may. Um, so one was, how do you think that you could ultimately have a slightly more pragmatic debate and realistic debate about AI when, on the one hand, and here I'm being a bit, you know, trying to caricature a bit, but you have ultimately companies who perhaps, you know, to kind of get investment or whatever their incentives are that end up making quite grandiose commercial claims about what their products can actually end up doing. And I think this is quite a, quite something that you see starkly within the area of healthcare, where ultimately, you know, the commercial claims that companies make versus what they actually write in their intended use for their device can, can be quite um, quite a big gap. And then that kind of desire of, of public servants, politicians to just, you know, jump on that hype bandwagon, ultimately find a technology that somehow has this kind of aura of infallibility that absolves people from having to think hard about those outcomes. And so I, I just don't really know how you ultimately reconcile that dichotomy in the public debate to mm. be able to you know, have a, a realistic conversation about actually what the technology can and can't do. Second question, <laughs> very briefly, um, is, is ultimately, 
you know, as, as you said, there's that, that desire to want to advance the technology, completely get that. But then there's also the question of the ability of government to be able to deliver. <coughs> so in a previous life, having worked in an AI lab related to government, um, <laughs> I really question that, that ability to be able to attract that skill, to be able to, mm -hmm. to retain it, and to be able to have the understanding to deliver these programs that are ultimately quite complex, and to be able to have a good kind of negotiator on the other side of the table talking to industry to be able to really be see the wood from the trees, so. Yep. Uh, does anyone want to go first or do you want me to? I'm, I'm always happy to speak as part of my job, so i um, <laughs> happy to do so. Um, uh, on, on capabilities, I have two observations. Um, uh, one, the reason I think this should be a bottom-up national innovation challenge as opposed to a top-down is because when you do the top-down thing, you know, you get the procurement guys buying a solution, implementing it. It's a single point of failure. And then when it goes wrong or goes over budget or doesn't deliver what it's supposed to deliver because we never get the a kind of star quality um, stuff because of our budget, um, everyone says, oh, well, we shouldn't really do this stuff, should we? But it's a single point of failure. And I would much rather we had an innovation ecosystem across the country knowing that quite a lot of it will fail but that you can manage that risk and find the things that, that work. The capability question there that's really interesting is much like the most innovative companies, can the state in facilitating and procuring that kind of ecosystem of innovations spot and kill the failures quickly so that you're not paying for failure to go on for too long? I don't know the answer to that question, but I think it's a really interesting mm. question. Um, and then the second um, point, the, the state can't do everything and it shouldn't try to do everything. And it should be really clear about what it can do and where it adds value. This kind of comes back to the point around industrial policy or the power of convening, or as Keir Starmer talks about, missions, where he wants the kind of all players in the economy to be focused on particular public policy priorities. Um, and I think you know, this is a classic space for that, where we have to be frank with investors, the private sectors, universities, advisory bodies, academics, others. Um, that we want to try to achieve something together, but don't think the state is just going to fix all of this because we can't. I'll add on to uh, Nathan, you should also, yeah. Um, I think on the dichotomy, actually, Nathan and I were just sort of briefly chatting about this before. Um, I think the safety question has been very hard to pass from both a public and political level because when you've got, and I think you're completely right on this, when you've got like people like Jeff Hinton, you've got you know, a completely world-leading AI research is coming out and being quite strong on safety. I, I think, even regardless if you don't think you know, sort of, you know, some of the sort of the, the sort of the let's say the wilder ends of this, I think politicians have to respond to that because that's a very strong signal that the technologists are sending that there is a concern here, and so, uh, you know. I, the thing that Nathan and I were then sort of chatting about a little bit was like, how do you sort of, I guess, make sense of that? And how do you actually then get the sort of the question around that? Because then you've got then some of the, obviously the more like your Mark Andreessen types who are like, AI will save us all. Um, and then they go for sort of the full kind of like, say the sort of the booster and accelerationist view of this. Um, and then they'll sort of, I think they'll simultaneously then say, well, governments are going to get, you know, they're going to be horrible on regulation and they're going to, they're going to focus all on safety, whereas then actually a lot of then the technologists are also sending that signal as well. And I think, I think that this is why the sort of that proper form of structured engagement, and I'm not quite sure what sort of form it takes, it is really, really important and why it sort of has to happen now. And when you've got you know, people like Demis, who I think is incredibly thoughtful on this at DeepMind and talks about the precautionary principle and thinks that you, know, you have to have some form of safety effort and that then also that ultimately builds trust within the system because the public aren't going to then want to adopt a technology if they think, oh, well, this might have some 
pretty <laughs> profoundly bad consequences. So that sort of consent mechanism and trust is all now just going to be entirely important. But it's, I think the important is how you actually structure that conversation with the right people in the room. Um, because I think politicians either way now have got to respond to this and have answers to it. Um, uh, and they will get it from the sort of, I'm sure Darren will say, they'll get it from the public on the doorstep. Like, what are we doing about AI safety? Because we've had all these like, large scale debates. But I do think there's a, there is a sort of de escalation that needs to happen, but it also needs to happen with a pro proper structured engagement with the right people. Um, and I know that might sound a bit sort of platitudinal politics stuff, but uh, I, I think it is really, really important. I think um, uh, and we sort of try to put out a few ideas for how we begin to do that, but um, that's why I think that's probably the, the biggest question that we need to answer today. Um, yeah, for me, the chasm between capabilities and reality like, ultimately comes down to. Um, like how, how well you understand how things work because you know if, if you don't then you imagine things in your head and you consume the hype um, and uh, and sort of think purely at a macro level as to how these things can apply to you and then you see it in front of you and like that's super underwhelming and I feel like any time that you have this like big chasm between expectations and reality like things topple over and take too long etc so I think some of these ideas that we discussed would be a good way to sort of normalize the chasm between capabilities and reality by kind of getting much closer to the, uh, you know, the source of these innovations and, and getting like continual advice and, and working with private sector to like actually yeah. figure out, yeah, what works and what doesn't. Thanks, hi, I'm Lubal Drummond from the CMA's Digital Markets Unit. Um, so I have a question about regulation. Um, <laughs> from my experience working kind of in and with other regulators, I found there's kind of often a very like healthy outcomes-led approach to interventions. Um, in my view, making them a quite suitable place to develop the regulatory kind of guardrails we might need to deal with some of the challenges from AI. But I just wondered from your perspective whether you think the kind of current approaches to collaboration between regulators, for example, is sufficient to deal with these challenges or whether we need kind of new institutions um, to do this and, and kind of what those look like in the government stack, as it were? Yeah. Uh, I think the short answer is no, they're not right. But Darren, why don't you, uh, <laughs> why don't you lead us off and I'll offer some thoughts again. Um, I like the Digital Regulators Cooperation Forum. Um, uh, I, I guess this audience knows what that is, but if, if you don't, I mean, it's, the, it's a non-statutory um, uh, kind of forum uh, for four, currently four regulators, so the Information Commissioner, the Competition and Markets Authority, um, the Financial uh, Conduct Authority, and Ofcom. Um, and they kind of coordinate um, with each other, but the DRCF is not a, um, uh, a decision-making body, but it just means there's kind of sharing of, of information and kind of collaboration, which I think is, is nice. Um, clearly, though, there's already a bit of a view that maybe that needs to grow. Uh, if you look at the number of regulators the government highlighted in the AI white paper, you know, you want the Human Rights Commission, you want the Health and Safety Executive, you want others thinking and being active in these spaces. So I think there's an interesting question for the forum as to whether they come into there or whether there's a new body. I mean, I'd rather we just use what we had if we think, think it worked. But there's a scale up question. The other thing that um, animates us a bit um, in Parliament, um, but this goes back to the point for Parliament having to be innovative, um, is the oversight question. So we're giving organisations like yours and others much more responsibility, um, uh, much broader legal powers. Uh, we've lost the oversight that we had from the European Parliament when these decisions were made in Brussels, and so that's come back to us in Westminster, but our capacity hasn't necessarily increased as a consequence of that. Um, and, uh, you know, we saw the debate with Microsoft Activision, I know an ongoing case, and we've seen the debate with the Digital Markets Unit Bill in Parliament. Politicians get a bit nervous about, you know, giving regulatory bodies decision-making powers without, I don't know, you shouldn't have to check with someone like me because I'm not qualified to answer your question. But the, the checks and balances in the system do worry people a bit. And I think if we are going to be doing this much more, i.e. devolving decision-making capability in the way that I've said that we should, we then in Parliament and in government also need to be comfortable that we build our own capacity for proportionate checks and balances in the system. Um, so that if at a kind of strategic level, we feel, to take your example at the DMU, um, that the kind of economic opportunities are being missed 
imbalance for use of wider powers that we've given you. That is ultimately Parliament and Government's decision for the direction of the country. So how do you do that review and checkpoint and feedback loop? Um, and I don't think we've quite figured that out yet. So there's probably something there that needs to change. Mm. I think just one just point to add as well, and I think it relates to what um, Nathan was saying before as well, is on getting the right kind of experts is one of the, the, mm. the points that we're quite, we've been quite, you know, let's say, bullish on in the last couple of reports. And I think, I think someone like, you know, to, to take the sort of the task force in AI at the moment, having like Matt Clifford running that, I think was a, you know, really, really good decision. Um, and it sort of breaks the mold of where a lot of often Whitehall is taking its expertise in some of these uh, places. And I think, you know, the sort of the next chair of the task force will be incredibly important for its sort of success and how it reports into the prime minister, et cetera. And I think, you know, some of these bodies across government um, and where they have worked have often been where they've got the kind of the right mix of people with the right expertise feeding in. I think, you know, DSIT again has got people like Saul Klein uh, coming in who have actually experienced sort of yeah, you know, the sort of the coal face of technology, and you don't want to then just sort of stack it all full of those people as well, because you don't get the balance. But Whitehall needs to be much more comfortable about bringing in those kind of experts that have been at the forefront of building, as well as then people from civil society and from sort of academia, etc., uh, to make sure that you get that right kind of balance of expertise always feeding into regulation. Um, because I, I just think if you don't have people that really sort of fundamentally understand these things advising you you're just going to get bad advice so um you know you need to make sure that you are always basically finding the world leading experts to to be part of this and to make sure that you can be creative and get them involved with uh government sort of decision making and i think that's where something like the us is often a lot better at the uh, than the uk because it you know gets sort of very very top industry figures feeding into whether that's <coughs> semiconductors or you know, even running its sort of national science stuff or Council of Economic Advisors, um, and we should be a, you know, a lot happier trying to sort of build that kind of profile people into our sort of processes. Cool, Molly. How are we time wise? Um, oh. We are dead on the hour. Okay, is that so? Finito or one more? <laughs> um, <you're cool. laughs> All right, we'll take one more. <laughs> Paul, yeah. Hi, uh, Paul Mulby from Faculty Fact. It's a, a, a deployed AI uh, company. Uh, first of all, thanks for the report. It's an area where there's a lot of, um, might we say, like a bit of hype and nonsense at the moment, and to have a really good report is a really good contribution to the debate. So thank you for that. Um, I was just picking up your, your comments here about um, government. Um, Faculty works across the public services, and uh, we work with some really amazing digital data and technology teams, and I think it's an underappreciated uh, uh, reform over the last decade or so, the, the quality and competence of those digital teams in and across government. But I think they're often seen by the wider system as a very niche sort of nerdy thing that lives in the figurative basement. <laughs> and beyond bringing in, you know, external uh, people, and which presumably will always be a handful, I'm interested in how you get the wider government system to move on a couple of generations. Mm. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm conscious this is being broadcast, but I'll answer with my <laughs> initial view. Um, um, I, would l I would like it if we changed, I think it's the civil service code, to make permanent secretaries um, more accountable to the innovation arm. So one of the challenges with the government digital service, as I understand it, was that you know these guys with MacBooks and jeans and T-shirts turned up at permanent secretary's office and he kind of thought they were slightly strange and told them to go away. Um, I, I'm sure it's more nuanced than that, but that, that's as I understand it. Um, so I would, I would love if DCIT was going to become a department, as I said earlier, that's this kind of catalyst or um, consultancy for other Whitehall departments. I would love it if the permanent secretary at health has a duty to cooperate with the permanent secretary at DCIT and that they are jointly accountable for innovation KPIs. I would go even further and say I would love it if departments spending their capital budgets had to do an innovation checkpoint first uh, with DCIT to say, actually, do you just want to re-procure what you're buying, or is this an opportunity to do something uh, differently? So I think you need those kind of mandatory checks and joint accountability within the system uh, for that to work so that it doesn't just become 
a niche thing in one department, maybe at the whim of a particular minister that might be interested for five minutes. I think that's a great way to end it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, and as I say, we released the report today. Um, so if anyone wants to read it, it's on institute.global. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you.